So, Simon 12.2, um, this is like our first free response review assignment, getting us ready for our first practice test. So, I thought I'd throw some free response questions at you that might be good review. Some of them are pretty recent, differential equations, slope field, first one, shouldn't seem too bad. Uh, hopefully you tried it already on your own. On the axis of five, sketch slope field with a given differential Equation at 12 points indicated from negative 1 to 1. Sketch the solution curve through the point 0, negative 1. So that's a particular solution. Now, it says 12 points. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's none on the x-axis. There's a good reason for that. I'm not trying to trick you. In fact, they're trying to help you by not putting dots there and you accidentally sketching. Um, it Because... That's when y equals 0. That's when it's undefined, which we shouldn't technically draw a slope store because it doesn't exist. It equals 0 when x equals negative 1. So 0, 0, 0, 0. You just got third of the points in there. If you plug in 0 for x, 1 for y, you get 1. 0 for x, 2 for y, you get 1 half, uh, up 1 over 2, less steep than the last one. If you do uh, 0, negative 1, you get negative 1. Do 0, negative 2, you get negative 1 half. So you see some symmetry here. I bet these two might mirror these. 1, 1 is going to be slope of 2, up 2 over 1. Uh, 1, negative 1. It's going to be slope of negative 2. Uh, 1, 2 is going to be a slope of 1, which kind of looks nice there. And um, <clears throat> 1, negative 2 is going to be a slope of negative 1. So you see these slopes kind of like running into each other. It's kind of interesting. So that's your slope field. Uh, point breakdown here for 9 points is 3 points, 1 point, and 5 points. So three points for the uh, slope field. Now, I haven't finished. Three points would be too much for just a slope field. Usually it's two points, probably one for the zero slopes and one for the non-zero slopes. So one point for these and one point for these. They did say sketch solution curve um, going through zero, negative one. <clears throat> so you might guess that you're going to be stuck on these slopes over here. Now what happens over here at negative 2, 1, you're going to get a slope of negative 1 also, but, and you might be tempted to keep this line going, but you have to stop it here because the slope isn't defined there. And that's a domain issue. And so this is your curve. It goes forever to the right, down to the right, but it stops right here. You have to put open circle because a single open interval is a domain of solution of differential equation. And this is a picture of the solution. So that's one point. Don't forget the whole domain issue. Okay. Part B, while the slope field in part A is drawn at only 12 points, it is defined at every point in the xy plane for which y doesn't equal zero. Define, describe all points the xy plane where y doesn't equal zero, where the slope equals negative one. Now you can look at the picture and be like, oh, it looks like they're negative one here, and I think they keep going here. Maybe they're up here. But the I don't know. I think the the most obvious way is to go ahead and just set your derivative equal to negative one and solve for it. Now, if you solve for this, uh, you get x plus y or x plus one equals negative y, and so y equals negative x minus one. So it's a line, which looks like this line. It keeps going. And so you could say all the points on this line, y equals negative x minus 1. Don't say y, you know, all the points on the line, except that uh, y can't be 0, which they stated, but maybe we should say it again. I feel like we've seen questions kind of like that before. Where are all the slopes positive? Are they all negative? It's only one point, so don't worry too much about it. But, you know, try it. Now, part C is five points. So you might guess by now, 
that it's probably going to be finding the particular solution of a differential equation with the initial condition. So we're going to take the differential equation, the derivative, and we're going to undo it to get the original equation. Now, to get any of these five points, you have to successfully separate the variables. X is with the dx, Y is with the dy, multiplication division to separate things from one side to the other. <clears throat> That's one point. If you don't do it, though, zero out of five points. Then you're going to integrate both sides. You get y squared over 2 equals x squared over 2 plus x plus c. You got one point for antiderivatives of both sides total, one point for the plus c, another point for finding the c, which I would find right now. They gave you this initial condition that you might write down. This is your x, this is your y. So we're going to plug in y, in parentheses, squared over 2 equals 0 squared over 2 plus 0 plus c. c equals positive 2. That's another point. So we're going to rewrite it, plug it back in. And then we're going to solve for y. So we multiply both sides by 2. Distribute y squared equals x squared plus 2x plus 4. Square root of both sides, plus or minus. Now you need to decide, is it plus or minus? We're finding a particular solution. That's 1, plus or minus is 2. Plug initial condition 0, 0 squared is 0, plus 2 times 0 is 0, plus 4 is uh, 4, squared 4 is 2, and it's supposed to come out negative, so we need the negative. And so there's your solution, but you also need to make sure you put the domain. So the domain, there's a couple issues. One x squared plus 2x plus 4 needs to be greater than or equal to 0. So there's a domain just for the equation that we got for our answer. That's part of it. The other part is you have to check the original derivative, make sure it's defined. And if it's undefined anywhere, you could break it up. And it's not just regular old domain. It's going to be a single open interval contain, containing the initial condition. Um, we could try and factor this. Um, you know, you could say, okay, well, I mean, this is always true, isn't it? Isn't anything plus two squared always going to be positive, greater than or equal to zero? Um, I mean, I feel like that's all reals, but so, I mean, I think this is all reals, but up here, y can't be zero. I'm not allowed to use y equals zero. So you're like, well, don't put that on your number line. Y isn't part of the domain. Domain's X is, but that doesn't mean we ignore it. It means we take our new equation that we just found for Y and we set it equal to zero and we try and figure out what the X values that goes with it. Now, we were just kind of doing that right here. It's going to be when X equals negative two, which is fine in this function. We can take the square root of zero when X equals negative two, but the derivative isn't defined. And so, it's like we have a number line. I like to do this, just like draw a picture and say, okay, well, where's the initial condition? Zero, x equals zero is over here. So it's going to be that single open interval. So the domain is parentheses negative two to positive infinity. And that matches also with our picture on part A, where we said we had to put an open dot at x equals negative two. Number five, this should look familiar. So just recent chapter, let R be the region in the first quadrant bounded by the graph of Y equals two square root of X, which is what they've given us right here. A square root function looks like a sideways, half of a sideways parabola, horizontal line, Y equals six. I'm gonna add stuff to the picture just to kind of help me identify it. The Y axis is also a boundary. So that's this shade area, and part A just says to find the area. Okay, no calculator on this problem, so you're going to actually have to work it out. Now it's up to you. Do you want to do vertical slices, 
Y top, minus Y bottom, or do you want to do horizontal slices? X right, minus X left. Either one, I'll do it both ways. You just need to do it one way, but you can actually have to find the answer. So if we do vertical slices, and we should get the same answer either way, if we do Y top minus Y bottom, that's gonna be DX slices, left to right now, the coordinates of the intersections um, are all pretty much known. Um, and so we're gonna go from left to right, zero to nine, Y top in terms of X is six, minus Y bottom in terms of X is two square root of X, DX. That's your setup. That's worth one point. The point breakdown here is three, three, three. So one point for the setup. Um, then we're gonna actually integrate it, six X. Now this is X to the one half. So this is gonna be minus two X to the three halves, divide by the new exponent, multiply by the reciprocal, zero to nine. Don't need to do a plus E. One point for the setup, one point for the antiderivative, and then we're gonna go ahead and find the answer, plug nine in. Plug zero in. Those go away. We have 54 minus square root of nine is three, cubed is 27, over three is nine, times four is 36. And the answer is 18, and that's one point. <clears throat> Alternatively, you could do horizontal slices. You would then be integrating bottom and top, zero to six. You're doing X right. Now X right is gonna be Y over two squared or Y squared over four, which is gonna be better for integration. If you leave the Y minus the Y over two inside the squared, don't simplify it, you're gonna to have to do chain rule. And a lot of you guys are just forget to do chain rule. X left is zero. So it's gonna be Y squared over four dy, which is actually seems like a pretty nice way of doing it. So I can move the one fourth in front and then integrate this. It's gonna be y cubed over three, zero to six, one twelfth, six cubed, minus one twelfth, zero cubed. Uh, one of these sixes goes in here twice, 36 over two, or one half of 36 equals 18. There you go. Either way. So you guys should be getting pretty good at that. Um, part B says write, but do not evaluate an integral expression. Integral expression means better have an integral. That gives the volume that's all generated when R is rotated around the horizontal line, Y equals seven. So I'm gonna draw that up here. I mean, you could redraw it, but I feel like I have enough room here. Y equals seven is above Y equals six. So it's gonna get rotated. And that's the other half. And so we're doing trying to do a solid uh, revolution. Now we could do vertical slices, perpendicular to the axis rotation, which are gonna give us disc washer slices. We have a big R and a little r. Big R is Y top minus Y bottom. Little r is Y top minus Y bottom. The volume is going to be pi big R squared DX minus pi little r squared DX. And we're gonna integrate left to right in the X direction, zero to nine. Now big R is Y top, which is seven minus Y bottom which is this curve in terms of X, which is two square root X squared DX my, uh, minus pi zero to nine, little r, Y top is seven, Y bottom is six squared DX. They said to set it up, write it with integrals, but do not evaluate it. Which is, if they're not gonna give you a calculator, like sure, maybe they'll make you do one, and the other ones will just be like, yeah, set it up. Or you could do horizontal slices, 
which would give you shells. And you have a height, and you have a radius. The height is x right minus x left. The radius is y top minus y bottom. The volume of a shell, it's a tube, cut it open, get a rectangle. One of the dimensions of the rectangle is the original circumference around the shell, 2 pi r times h, dy, integrate. So 2 pi, now the limits are in the y direction, bottom and top, 0 to 6. Uh, the radius is y top, which is 7 minus whatever y value we're at. The radius of a shell doesn't depend on the curves. The height is x right, which is y over 2 squared minus x left, which is 0, dy. Either way, you can get full credit. Now, usually in the scoring guidelines, they'll probably only show the disk wash method, but they will... They used to require the shell method sometimes. Now they don't care, but they generally only present the disk washer method. So C, region R is the base of a solid for each Y, where zero to six, the cross section of the solid taken perpendicular to the Y axis is a rectangle whose height is three times the length of its base. Write, but do not evaluate. Don't do extra work. You don't have time to. And any work you do could be scored. So if you do extra work and you make mistakes, not only are you wasting time, but you're possibly losing points that you've already earned. So make sure you make a big deal about that. Now I'm going to redraw this just because my picture up there is way messy. So I think it's time to redraw it. And this one sounds, so this sounds like a volume by cross section problem. So we still have the same curves. I'm going to redraw them. I'm going to label them. Put the intersection points. Maybe shade it lightly. OK, so the cross sections are perpendicular to the y axis. Oh, so they're sideways. It makes a difference. Volume by cross section can't do vertical or horizontal. It really depends on the way they describe it because it changes the shape and gives you a different volume. It says they're rectangles and, and it says that their height is three times the base. So that's each slice right there, the rectangle. That's the common cross section. So we're trying to find volume of a cross section. So that means that there's some common area in terms of y since we're doing horizontal slices dy. And in this case, it's a rectangle. And in this case, it's base times height makes a rectangle. And for us, the limits are zero to six in the y direction. The, the base is, um, I mean, we could write base and then the, uh, we could say, well, the, the height is three times the base, they said, right? So it's going to be ba uh, three base squared. Now we could bring the three out front if you want or not. That's up to you. But the base is x right minus x left, it needs to be in terms of y. We already found these. X right up top was y squared over four. X left was zero. So it's gonna be y squared over four squared dy. This is good enough. For your response, you don't have to simplify your answer. Just leave it. I've been okay with these kind of answers on my test too. That's good enough. Don't put in your calculator. You don't have a calculator. Don't do it by hand, even though you could. Just stop, you're good, you're done. So that was a nice, you know, I don't know. I feel like you guys should be comfortable with those kind of problems. We've been doing a lot of those recently. So I'm just trying to get you ready for your first practice test. You know, throw in some last, the first two kind of recent types of problems. Well, let's do some older ones. Now we haven't done a lot of free response problems for a lot of topics because they kind of, often involve um, 
like topics from the whole year. So now we're ready. We're going to be doing tons of free response questions over the next month. Just going to help you get ready for your AP test. Um, the graph of the velocity of a car traveling a straight road, straight road, so it's a rectilinear motion, motion one direction for zero to 50 as your endpoints, a table of values for VT. So they show you a graph of the velocity. And then they give you values of velocity, five second intervals. So then they give you a table also. So these kind of go together. Anytime you see table, you should probably assume you're going to do some kind of estimation technique because you just have you just have specific values. You don't have a function. Even this graph right here, you don't. It's you know it's going to be hard to. You don't know the you don't know the fun, the equation for that curve. So you're, you're not going to you know integrate or take derivatives of normal things. You can probably just use specific values a during what time intervals uh during what time interval uh, what intervals of time is the acceleration of the car positive give a reason for your answer acceleration positive so acceleration is the derivative of velocity so that means when is the derivative of velocity positive and if you have a graph of the velocity it's asking us when is the slope of that graph positive so you can look at it and be like oh it's it looks like it's zero to 35 and 45 to 50. So maybe we should say that. Acceleration of the car is positive on 0 to 35 and 45 to 50, what are the units? Seconds. So that pretty much just answers the question, which is a good thing to do. But it says to give a reason for your answer. Like, well, how do you know that? Well, I just told you, right? Don't be like, because the graph is going up. It's too, you know, too vague since velocity is increasing. That means the velocity is going up, right? On the intervals 0 to 35 and 45 to 50. Now, you'll notice I put brackets on these because increasing, decreasing, we generally include the endpoints. But I wouldn't say the acceleration is positive when the slope is 0. I'd say the acceleration is 0. So my answer doesn't include the endpoints. The way I support my answer with something that is that, you know, usually we would include the endpoints. Okay. B, find the average acceleration of the car in feet per second squared over time. Okay. So we're definitely doing mean value theorem of something. Now, do you have an equation for acceleration to do mean value theorem of just as like a normal function? No. And we're, there's no way we're going to get an equation. We have a lot of information about velocity and acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So what we probably want to do is we want to find a average, which is going to equal v prime average. And mean value theorem for derivatives say, okay, well, we'll just find the slope between the endpoints, 0 to 50. So here's 0 to 50. And, and so we're just find the slope between the endpoints. That's how we find the average slope. So we should set it up and be like, okay, well, it's going to be V50 minus V0 over 50 minus 0. And these values are on the table. V50, 72, V0, 0, over 50 minus 0, equals 72 over 50, equals 36 over 25 feet per second squared. Now you pro you could do average acceleration equals the integral of acceleration. Remember how you find the area of the curve and you smooth it out from zero to 50 and then you divide by the base of the rectangle to get the height of the rectangle. I mean, you could set it up like this and be like, all right, that's one over 50. And you say, well, what's the antiderivative of acceleration? You're like, I don't know, I don't have an equation, but I know the antiderivative of acceleration is velocity. Right? And then you got to plug the limits in. 
And guess what you get eventually? Oh, same stuff we just got. So, I mean, it's up to you. I mean, you could do it this way if you want. Same answer. A little extra work at the beginning. Um, so that's a little mean value theorem for you. Um, okay, C says, find one approximation for the acceleration of the car in feet per second squared at t equals 40. Show the computations you use to arrive at your answer. So 40 is right here. A lot of times when they say to approximate the derivative from a table, that means you're going to do rise of run. You're going to find the slope between two points near the one you want. And usually the point they ask you for is like in between points they give you. This time they gave us one of the, they actually told us to find out one of those points. So the reason they say is to find one is there's actually three ways. We could go do a left end approximation, use the left point and this point, a right end, this point, and the right point, or a symmetric approximation. So there's three possible answers here because of the way they did it. Usually they give you a point in between and you just use the nearest points on either side. So it's one of these approaches. You could say, all right, well, approximation for the acceleration at 40, which is the derivative at 40, could be V45 minus V40, slope between 40 and the point, the very next point that we know, plug in those values, show your work, show your setups, and put your units negative feet per second squared um, is approximation for A40. So I use that symbol right here. This is exact and this is an approximation. So that's one way you do it. Or you could say, all right, well, let's approximate the derivative of 40 uh, using V40 and the point before it, V35. And so we would use 75 minus 81 over 40 minus 35 equals negative six over five feet per second squared is approximation for A40. Different answer, different technique. These are all approximations. Or you could do it as like a symmetric. Use a point to the left and the right, which is kind of what we usually do because we don't have the point. So you could do V45 point the very next point minus the previous point v35 and put those values from the table 60 minus 81 so you want to show all this work you want to show the setups you very you know label things um so negative 21 over 10 feet per second squared is the approximation for A40. So any one of those, you, that's not usually going to be the case, but um, all right, part D says approximate zero to 50 of VT DT with a Riemann sum. Riemann sums are rectangles using the midpoints of five subintervals of equal length using correct units explain the meaning of this interval. Um, I can say let's just try and find it first. Now, what we're doing is we're going to do agreement sums, you know, integrating, finding the area in a curve with rectangles. You either do left Riemann sum, right Riemann sum, or midpoint. And they'll tell you which one to do, and they're telling us to do midpoint. And they're saying from zero to fifty, which is the whole table, and we're doing midpoint, so we're probably going to use you know, the midpoints. So they, with midpoints, they give you a lot of extra information. They said five equal subintervals, right? So this is 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, five equal subintervals, 10 each from zero to 50. And those are the values we're going to use. Now I'm going to draw a picture just because I find it helpful. You're not going to get points for the picture, but you might make lots of mistakes. I don't know. 
So I'm going to say, all right, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And then we're actually looking at 5, 15, 25, 35, 45 for the heights of the rectangles. So I'm going to just draw those in roughly. 5, we're at 12. 15, we're at 30. Uh, 25, we're at 70. I'm not trying to make these perfect, just relatively correct. 35, we're at 81. And at 45, we're down to 60. So we're going to draw rectangles that have those heights. So there's five rectangles. Bases are all 10. A lot, of time, a lot of times the bases can change, but they said equal. So I have a really nice picture right here. And all I got to do now, I need a, anything I write on here is probably not going to give me credit. So I need to show my work that looks like I'm doing areas of rectangles 10 times 12, 10 times 30, 10 times 70, 10 times 81. 10 times 60, so that's 120 plus 300 plus 700 plus 810 plus is that 10 times 60, 600. Zero, three, 11, 19, 25. So this equals 2530. What are the units? Well, just think about it. Velocity is feet per second, but DT has units. It's seconds. And so this should be feet just by kind of unit analysis. That also might help you decide what this is because you guys says using correct units, explain the meaning of this integral. Context of the problem usually. So we're going to say 0 to 50 VT DT. Now, do you guys remember what you what the integral velocity is? That's displacement. Right? So um, is the displacement of the car And we could we could write our answer 2530 feet units using the correct units. Make sure you talk about displacement being in feet. That's not enough. Um on or from time t equals zero to t equals fifty. So you gotta mention the very specific times. And you got to put the units on them. It says using the correct unit. So those are supposed to be seconds. So you got to put seconds. So if you don't say displacement, if you don't say feet, if you don't say the times, if you don't put the units of time, this is probably just one point. So any of those things missing, you lose that. Now, this is kind of interesting um, because we actually could say it a little more specifically. Instead, so the integral of velocity is usually displacement. Or you, or you could say the total change in position. So generally, if you integrate a derivative, you're going to get the total change in the thing that is the derivative of. Velocity is the derivative of position. So in most cases, we'll say, if they give us the integral of a derivative of something, we say it's the total change in that original thing. Now, there's a special term for that in motion. They call it displacement. That's just a special name for it. But there's also another special thing that if you integrate the absolute value velocity, you get distance. Generally, this is not distance because it doesn't have the absolute value. But if velocity is positive the whole time, which it is, then it actually is also distance. 
which might be the most best specific answer here, but I don't know. I'm assuming that if you said displacement, you get the point still. So, all right, that's kind of interesting. Had a little mean value theorem review in there. Had some motion stuff in there. Had some estimating derivatives from two points. Had estimating the area of a function with Riemann sums. Good stuff. Okay, last one. Now, right away, if you see a table, you should think, oh, I'm going to do estimation techniques probably. Probably going to have to do like Riemann sums or trapezoids to find the area under the curve. I might have to find the slope between two of those points to estimate the derivative. But I'm probably going to be doing a lot of estimating because I don't have like a function for all the values. A zoo sponsor one day contest to name a new baby elephant. Zoo visitors, visitors to spot deposit entries in a special box between noon and 8 p.m. So those are your endpoints probably. The number of entries in the box t hours afternoon is modeled by the differentiable function, differentiable, not different, not differential, but differentiable. That means its derivative exists everywhere. By a differentiable. No, actually, it is a differentiable function. So this is a this is a rate, and if you look at the units, it's mm, actually no, it's not a rate. Okay, it's a differentiable, not differential. Function. So that just means its derivative exists everywhere. Okay, it means it's a smooth graph and continuous. The eyes of ET in hundreds of entries at various times t are shown in the table above. A use the data in the table to approximate the rate in hundreds of entries per hour at which entries are being deposited times six. Show the computations that lead to your answer. Time six is right here. This is a little more. We just got done doing this. I said we could do the last one three different ways. Well, this time we're gonna use the points right, ne right next to six, and six isn't one of the points. So a lot of times with tables, you gotta estimate the derivative, which means you're gonna find the slope between the two closest points. So E prime six is approximately E of seven minus E of five over seven minus five, it's just rise over run. And write this down, okay? This is your setup. After that, you're just gonna plug numbers in. So you're gonna plug, all right, 21 minus five over seven minus five is 16 over two is eight. Put the units, or sorry, did I mess up? Okay, 21 minus 13, I don't know what I did. 21 minus 13 is eight over two is four. But that's why you show your setup, because then they'd be like, well, you knew how to set up. You just put the wrong value from the table. What are the units? Well, it's changing E prime is changing E over change in time. So E is hundreds of entries. And derivatives are generally rates per change in time per hour. So that's one point. The breakdown here is one point, three points, two points, three points. So that's one point. Pretty straightforward, quick, quick problem. They shouldn't give you a lot of points for that. Um, B using a trapezoidal approximate uh, trapezoidal sum with four subnumbers, four, given the table to approximate zero to eight. 1 over 8, using the correct unit to explain the meaning of it in terms of the number of entries. Okay, well, let's see if we can just try and find it first. 1 over 8, 0 to 8 of ET dt equals 1 eighth of the area under that curve. And it said four equal, it's four subintervals that are not necessarily equal. And there are 1, 2, 3, 4 chunks that we could use as values to break it up. I'm going to make a little picture. 0, 2, 5, 7, 8. And at 0, we're at 0. At 2, we're at 4. At 5, we're at 13. At 7, we're at 21. And at 8, we're at 23. And 
they just kind of roughly show, we're going to estimate the area of the curve, but with trapezoids, so you, you, you connect the two endpoints and you have all these trapezoids. Now they're sideways trapezoids. So the heights of the trapezoids are sideways and they're not all equal. So this is an approximation. So at this point it makes sense to do that. And we should show our, our trapezoids. Now you might be like, oh, this first one's not a trapezoid, it's a triangle. Well, guess what? You could treat it like a trapezoid. So a trapezoid that has a base that's four and a, and a base that's zero. And guess what happens when you average those? You get zero plus four over two is two times, the height is two, two times two is four. That's the same as a one half base times height, like for a triangle. So I would just show it zero plus four over two times two plus four plus 13 over two times three plus 13 plus 21 over two times two plus 21 plus 23 over two times one. I would show that work. You want to show them that you're doing trapezoids just in case you put the wrong numbers over. This picture is great for you to help you make sure, hopefully you set it up right, but don't count on anything right here getting you the credit for setup. Uh, let's see if we can simplify this. The twos, this is gonna be one eighth of four. Um, this is gonna be 17, 51 halves. Uh, that's gonna be 20, uh, 34. This is going to be 44 of 2 is 22. This is going to be 1 eighth of, it's going to be 25 and a half. So let's see, uh, 59, 63, 65, 85 and a half, or 161, 71 over 2 times 1 over 8. So it equals 171 over 16. What are the units? This is hundreds of entries. And this is time. So this is hours. But what's this thing in the front? Because we've got to figure this out too. When you see that, you guys should recognize that that's something special. You should be like, I don't know. That kind of looks familiar. I mean... You integrate something and then you're multiplying by one over eight. Isn't and isn't this like one over eight minus zero? Isn't that like we're dividing by the base of the rectangle? That's mean value theorem. That's and it's not for derivatives. That's the average number of entries in the box from time zero to time eight. That's mean value theorem. So if you realize that this is also ours and they canceled those, so this is gonna be hundreds of entries. Now let's 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 explain a little more directly. One eighth zero to eight of E T D T is the average value of E T. Okay, but they said like in the context of problem, the average number in hundreds of entries in the box from time t equals zero to t equals eight hours. Now you might also say from noon to 8 p.m. because that's what they said earlier. That's it. So you gotta put the units, you gotta mention the times, you gotta mention the context of the problem. Um, all right, so you got to recognize mean value theorem when they show it to you. Uh, the points on that, 
I think it was like one point for the explanation, one point for the answer, and one point for the trapezoidal setup. It's usually how it goes. C, at 8 p.m., volunteers began to process the entries. Ooh, this is starting to sound like a rate model now. Entries are coming into the box. Now volunteers are processing them. They process the entries at a rate modeled by, and by the way, this is a graphing carrier problem. GC, okay. Uh, they process entries at a rate modeled by the function P. So this is the process rate. It's kind of like the outgoing rate, the exiting rate. Entries from eight to 12 though, they didn't do it. So entries came in from zero to eight and then they processed them after it was over. They weren't doing it at the same time. How many entries had not yet been processed by midnight? Okay, well, so we have this processing rate. I'm gonna just write this down to have it conveniently next to where I'm gonna write my work. So I don't have to keep looking up and down. And this is only for eight to 12. Okay, so this is like a rate model, right? Um, the amount of entries at 12 is gonna equal the amount of entries at eight when the, the polling closed. Um, plus, you know, usually we have this incoming rate, eight to 12 of the entering rate ET DT, and then minus eight to 12 of the leaving rate, which they call PT. DT, but this is done. They're not taking any more. They're not taking any more entries after eight o'clock. Now, uh, how many entries were at eight o'clock? They told you right up there at the top. This is, you know, they told you that there's 23, right? That's the number of entries. So it's 23, and we're gonna do minus. 8, 12 of, now we could just write PT or you could write T cubed minus 30 T squared plus 298 T minus 976 DT. It's up to you. Um, but we're going to try and find the answer. Um, now you could work that out by hand. Go ahead if you really feel like you want to and you have the time for it. But um, if you have a calculator, just use your calculator. Don't be stubborn. This is going to be way faster on your calculator. So I'm going to do 23 minus math 9 x to the third minus 30x um, plus 298x. I just realized I made a mistake. It's supposed to be x squared, second insert squared. That insert thing is helpful so you don't have to retype stuff. Minus 976 comma x comma 8 comma 12 oh well, that's a nice answer it equals seven now is it just seven no it's 700 entries how many entries had not been had not yet been processed 700 entries had not yet been processed by midnight. Now, um, and this is what's left because we took the original amount, subtracted what they processed, or you could have calculated how much they processed and what it came out to 16. And then you would say, okay, well, let's take that away from the number of entries that were there when we started. So there's 700 left. D. Um, according to the model in part C, at what time were the entries being processed most quickly? What time were the entries being processed most quickly? Justify your answer. Now, my first intuition, most, whenever I see most, I'm thinking, oh, that's absolute max. It's like EVT, most quickly. So that's like uh, the rate. That's This is when P is the rate, right? 
P is the rate that they're processing. So most quickly would be when the rate is the biggest. So we're looking for absolute max of PT. So that's first challenge is to interpret what they're asking for. Now I'm going to do EBT unless you really like trying to justify some other approach that's not even designed for this and might, you know, sometimes work, but EBT. Now we have, I think we have endpoints. The endpoints are eight to 12 because that's when they're being processed. So those are your endpoints. We need critical points. Now, critical points, you got to show the work and the setup for this. How do you find critical points? Well, that's when you take the derivative of the thing that you're trying to find the absolute max or min of. And we could do this by hand, no problem. So just polynomial 3t squared minus 60t plus 298. And you set it equal to zero or undefined, right? And then you solve it. Now, I don't. I guess you could try and solve these by hand. Um, it is a quadratic, so even if you can't factor it, you could uh, you could do quadratic formula to get the irrational roots. But why don't we use our calculator to do this? So I'm going to just put that one equation in. I'm not going. I don't want a beautiful graph of it. So I'm going to put this equation in. Three uh, x squared minus sixty x plus two ninety eight. I'm going to go to window. I only want answers from eight to 12, even though algebraically it's gonna give me other answers. I only wanna find the x-intercept. So I'm gonna do y minus negative one, y max is positive one. I'm gonna graph it. And I might get more than one, oh, two answers. I'm gonna get more than one curve point. You should write both of them down. I'm gonna do second, second calculate zero. This is eight, nine. So it looks like there's one between nine and 9.5, guess 9.2, and it is, 9.1835034. I'm writing down extra decimals because I'm going to use this for other calculations. Second calculate zero. That was eight, nine, ten, eleven. So there looks like there's one near eleven. So maybe ten point five to eleven, ten point nine guess. And it's ten point eight one six four nine seven. You need to write the derivative. You need to set it equal to zero. You need to write your critical points. You need to carry more than three decimals to make sure your final answer is accurate enough. So now we're going to make a table and we're going to plug them into PT, which was T cubed minus 30T squared plus 298T minus 976. We're going to do endpoints eight. 9.1835034, 10.816497, and 12. Now, nice thing about this, I'm going to go back to y and put this equation in x to the third minus 30x plus 298x minus 976. And then I can use the table to get my quick values here 8. 9.1835034, 10.816497, and 12. And we could just write those down 1680, 2259, 685601. 3188.314648 and 3968. So we're looking for the most, which is right here, it happens to be at an endpoint. So now we're going to put it into a nice answer. Um, the <laughs> entries, Maria Rune here, were being processed most quickly. Okay, so what was the most quickly rate? This is a rate right here. Uh, 3968 hundred entries per hour. It's a rate at time 
t equals 12 hours by extreme value theorem. Name it. Don't abbreviate it. You have to name it. How does that work? By checking endpoints and critical points. Nice one. I say so. All right. That's it. Some good review for your upcoming practice test.